All right. Well, I think that we will go ahead and get started. Welcome everybody for our 2021 legislative update with the Idaho Medical Association. We have a great turnout of people here that are heading in tonight. And I just wanna start by saying uh, thank you to our sponsor, Idaho Central Credit Union. And I'd like to introduce Angela Fish. She's a representative there at the credit union. And just to give a greeting and tell us a little bit more about the services that they provide our members. Angela? Absolutely. Can you all hear me okay? Yes. All right. Well, thank you, Stephen, for the introduction. Um, Idaho Central Credit Union is really excited to be a sponsor, and we're really excited to be part of the community. Um, just a little bit about Idaho Central Credit Union. We've been around since 1940. Probably all of you have heard and seen Idaho Central Credit Union everywhere. Um, we started off as a really consumer-driven credit union, and it's been like that for a long, long time, up until about 10 years ago when we um, implemented and started doing our business banking, uh, which we've gotten really, really good at our business banking. We have an entire business relationship department. Uh, I'm a business relationship officer here at IHCCU. We have lots of us spread throughout the Treasure Valley. And we do, we do business banking well. We have a department. We have our specialists on hand to where um, with our business members, we want to make sure that people are uh, they're answering phone calls when businesses need help. And so there's nothing worse than when a business member picks up the phone and tries to get through and needs help and, and isn't able to. So Idaho Central Credit Union has really uh, mastered that in our relationship and our business department. We also have merchant services in-house. We do uh, deposit treasury management. We have wealth management. We have private banking we do commercial lending and, and we do it all really well. So there, there was two really hard times in the past that I can think of right now, just back in 2008 and the economic downturn and then just during COVID and Idaho Central Credit Union skyrocketed during those times because we were almost set up uh, for success already during COVID because so many things can be done online these days. And we try to make really life easy for our members. Uh, we're member owned, we're non-for-profit and we're just all about giving back to the community. So we're really excited again to be a sponsor and we really appreciate that. And um, with that, I will let you guys continue with the legislative update. I was so thankful to be a part of this. Great. Thank you, Angela, and thanks for, again, for Idaho Central Credit Union. You're welcome to stay and see, uh, see what goes on here if you'd like to. Uh, okay, we'll have a lot of fun tonight. Thank you. <laughs> well, very good. Well, I, would, I do want to go ahead and, and start by introducing the, our board of directors who are here tonight, and they are the ones who really um, uh, make a difference for me in terms of leadership and setting priorities. And so I just want to start by introducing President Alice Blake, and then go on to the rest of ours. She's our new president as of this month. Uh, we have uh, incoming president or president-elect after James Whitaker, secretary treasurer Deb Roman, and then uh, past president Tom Pintar, who just stepped, uh, stepped down after seven years and is in his final year of service. And then also on our call today, we have uh, Ann Huntington and um, Deb Roman. I already mentioned Deb Roman. Uh, we have George Thomas, who is... Uh, who is kind of uh, uh, hanging out in the wings to be in the board, along with, uh, look at my rest of my list. You're getting them all up for me, right? I don't have my list. So uh, Mike Fouts, if he's here, Naya Ann Tink, Ann Huntington, and Amy Baruch are all on the call. All of them, uh, along with some others who are non-voting members and a resident rep, help make up the leadership of ACMS. And I can't thank them enough for what they do for us. So if you'll all just give them a virtual applause, however you wanna do that, that would be great. Thank you. All right. And with that, what I want to do is just uh, share our uh, agenda of what we're going to be uh, doing for the rest of the evening and then turn it over to Susie Pouliot. You can see here we're going to uh, introduce our lobby team and legislature introductions. And then we'll go through um, some of the topics that we have to share tonight. And uh, then we'll have a breakout room so that legislators and physicians can get to know each other a little bit better and share some of the things that affect the way they make decisions and the impacts that legislative policy makes on their practice. And then we'll have a wrap up with uh, Senator Winder and Representative Rubo uh, to help us uh, see their priorities at the end. So with that, I would like to go ahead and turn it over to Susie 
Keller, our CEO of the Idaho Medical Association. Susie. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. Uh, great to see everyone tonight. Thank you so much for taking the time to be here. Very much appreciated. So um, I will uh, first quickly introduce our lobby team, and then I will uh, introduce the legislators who have been able to join us thus far. Um, so first, I would like to thank our group who uh, is boots on the ground at the Capitol and also provides a lot of great information for our members throughout the year. Um, so first is our newest team member, Jamie Neal, our IMA Director of Government Affairs. He um, joined the IMA just about a year ago and great part of our team. And next is Ken McClure, who has been with the IMA longer than any of us, I believe, uh, our outside counsel and lead lobbyists. So very grateful to have you here with us. And then uh, Emily McClure, who is another valued member of our team, um, does a lot of great work for us. One of the members of our team who can't be here tonight is um, Blake Ude, but uh, so you are all very well represented. Um, then I would like to um, just take a moment and um, introduce our legislators. Um, I'm unclear who's on there. I believe we only have about half of our 10 folks who said they would join us. Um, so when I call your name, if you could please unmute yourself and um, give a brief introduction, that would be very much appreciated. I'll try and go in order of district to hopefully give you a heads up on that. Um, I'll start with Senator Grow, although I'm not sure that he is on with us at this time. Okay, um, Senator Martin, welcome. Thank you, thanks for the invite. Good to see you all. Excellent, and we'll we'll have a little bit more time for you to, uh, to share with us in the breakout rooms and if you have any questions or insights to share with us as we go. Um, I don't believe Senator Ward Engelking is with us at this time. Um, Representative Rubel. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Representative Alanda Rubel, District 18, which is uh, Southeast Boise, and I am on the House Health and Welfare Committee. Thanks for being with us. Um, and I haven't seen Representative Green at this point. And I don't think we have Senator Wintrow with us. She's here. She be here. Oh, sorry <laughs> about that. Senator Wintrow, please introduce yourself. Oh, gosh, it's so good to see everyone tonight. I just walked in the door and took my coat off. I still have my pin on from <laughs> the Senate. So um, whew, I'm glad I got here. It's good to see you. Thank you so much for being with us. Much appreciated. And uh, Representative Nekochea. Thank you. I'm delighted to, to be here and learn more about your current issues and just want to say thank you. Thank you to our entire medical community um, for all you have done and continue to do this, this past year and a half. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure that we have Senator Winder with us at this point. Um, we do have Senator Bear with us. Would you please introduce yourself? Oh, I think you might be muted. Okay, can you hear me now? Yep, there, it's unmuted. Hi, I'm Regina Bayer, District 21. Glad to be here tonight, thank you. Thank you. And uh, Representative Furch, I believe you joined us as well. And I'm afraid you're, there you go, thank you. We are still not hearing him. Oh, I'm sorry. We can't hear you, Representative. How about now? Yes. Awesome. Okay. I've had that happen one time before where my mic doesn't, um, doesn't work. Uh, Representative Furch, District 21, also on Health and Welfare. Wonderful, thank you so much for being with us tonight. 
Um, so what we hope to do is um, present you with some of our uh, issues that we are looking to um, work on in the upcoming 22 session. Um, and our physicians will present those would um, invite any of you who have questions about those particular topics. There's just four of them. As we go through them to um, feel free to ask about those. After we highlight those four topics, then we're going to go into breakout rooms uh, roughly by district. So we hope to have um, a legislator and some physicians and maybe a lobby team member or other staff support in each one of those uh, uh, waiting, I'm sorry, breakout rooms. And you'll be able to have a little more one-on-one uh, -on -one conversation in there. Um, and then we'll come back uh, to the big group after that. So We'll go ahead and get going with that part of the program and uh, talk about our legislative priorities. Um, the first one is one that I'm sure is familiar to all of you <laughs> who have been in the legislature, and that is with respect to um, expanding our physician workforce through um, expanding funding for graduate medical education. And um, I'd like to welcome Dr. Sandy Mudge to um, introduce that topic. So I'll hand it over to you, Dr. Mudge. Well, thank you so much. Um, I'm the lucky one who gets to go first tonight. Um, so as a, they asked me to speak because I am a former resident at Family Medicine Residency of Idaho and now am faculty there. Um, I grew up in Colorado and attended medical school at Tulane University in New Orleans. And then I came here to train and I loved it so much that I decided to stay in our great state of Idaho. Um, it's my pleasure this evening to support, uh, request your support for ongoing graduate medical education expansion. And this will be the fifth year of the 10 year residency expansion plan. This year, the State Board of Idaho, uh, along with the Idaho residency programs, are seeking 729,000 in new funding for 2022. This money will help to increase residency positions by another 14 slots across all of Idaho. Reasons to continue supporting this plan are to bolster the number of physicians that take care of patients here in Idaho. Residency programs are the leading providers of care for Medicaid, Medicare, and uninsured patients in Idaho. So by increasing resident physicians, you're actually increasing access to care for all of these patients. And I see this daily in my own clinic. I know that many of us do that we have so many patients who are just scrambling, trying to get in with anybody and everybody has closed panels. Um, and that's likely due to a number of factors, but one of those is all the new influx of arrivals to our state. Another major reason um, to support this is that by recruiting excellent physicians here to Idaho for residency, we are training doctors to stay in Idaho. Evidence shows that 50 to 75% of residents will end up practicing within 100 miles of where they trained. State data from the Association of American Medical Colleges shows that about 55% of residents um, who choose, to, oh, sorry, 55% of residents stay within their state of training after graduation. And we're actually beating that here in Idaho. Um, we have over 60% of resident physicians who choose to stay. And that number is actually even higher if you um, include the surrounding areas such as Eastern Oregon and Western Montana. Um, and now that we have an Idaho medical school, ICOM, we need to have residency spaces to finish training all of those physicians after they graduate medical school, or else we'll end up exporting physicians who are often um, grew up here in Idaho and wanted to stay here in Idaho. Um, over the years that I've been at fMRI, I've seen a lot of classes come and go. And um, we are looking particularly for high quality resident applicants that have a connection to Idaho and who are interested in providing care in rural or other underserved areas. Because of this, we have provided many Idahoans uh, with training and support to become physicians, especially for rural Idaho. And then we've also brought in a lot of people from other states, including the Northeast, South, Western states, um, and many of them have chosen to stay. So if you're out and about in Idaho um, and you encounter a doctor in some of these small towns, such as Jerome, McCall, Orofino, Cottonwood, just to name a few, um, those are doctors who have frequently been recruited outside of Idaho, came here to train at residency, and then stayed. And we're very proud to have them up there. Um, economics is another reason to give your support. So according to 2018 American Medical Association study, each Idaho physician supports 12.1 jobs on average with total wages and benefits of over 900,000 and produces 1.9 million in direct and indirect economic output. 
Overall, that equates to state and local taxes of 168.6 million from the 33,000 plus jobs and 2.5 billion in total wages and benefits that Idaho physicians support. So please consider joining our Idaho residencies, the IMA and the State Board of Education to support the ongoing funding for the fifth year of the 10 year graduate medical education expansion to help grow our overall physician workforce, increase access to care, meet the demands of a fast growing population and provide physicians who are the next generation of caregivers to replace Idaho's aging workforce. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Mudge. Um, for our legislators, any questions or comments about that proposal? Susie, uh, Senator Martin, I have a question. Yes, please go ahead. I, I guess the funding that you're looking for this year, uh, is it, uh, do you know, is it part of the governor's budget? Is it something that's already been set in or is it something that would additionally would have to support or try to support? Um, that's a great question. Thanks, Senator Martin. Uh, fortunately, the governor has been very supportive of this expanded funding over the first four years of the 10-year strategic plan for increasing GME in Idaho. So traditionally, it has been included in his budget. Um, this year, the plan actually called for a little more robust financial request that would have created more positions. But um, state agencies, including the State Board of Education, um, had to follow the 3.1% uh, maximum um, increase for budget requests. So the GME expansion request was scaled back to meet that standard. And so while nothing is ever 100% certain, we feel fairly confident that he will um, include that funding level in his budget recommendation to the legislature. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, can you explain how the money is used? Is it used to pay a salary? Is it used to administrate the program? How is it spent? Um, I will take a stab at that, and then I will turn it over to uh, some of our physicians who actually work in the residency programs, and they'll be able to uh, provide some additional insight on that. Um, what we know from information from across the country and our own experience in Idaho is that it costs roughly $180,000 per year to educate a resident. Most of the residency programs um, in the state of Idaho operate on kind of a three-legged stool where uh, the funding model that we are working towards um, envisions a third of the funding coming from the state, um, a third of the funding coming from the sponsoring institution, whether it's a university, a hospital, or other entity, and a third of the funding coming from the residency program itself, generating revenue from seeing patients, writing grants, et cetera. So those funds are used to not only um, the educational resources, uh, faculty, a stipend for the resident, EHR, support staff, et cetera, everything it takes to not only provide the training for the resident, but also the medical clinic that takes care of patients. So um, Dr. Mudge or other GME folks, if you would like to add any additional details, I would certainly welcome that. Okay, and um, so the then the the participating clinic isn't generating enough revenue off their efforts to make it more self sustaining. Um, that's a great question. And one thing about our residency training programs in the state of Idaho, they actually see a disproportionate share of Medicaid, Medicare, low income patients. Um, and so no, the revenue from the clinic itself does not cover the costs of the clinic plus the faculty training and all of the other resources needed for the education piece of it. Susie? Yes. I was just going to say, um, as you know, after serving, serving on the Joint Finance and Appropriations Committee for four years and really learning more about the program and actually visiting clinics, 
seeing where residents are working. I'm just so proud that the state of Idaho has decided that this is an important program for our citizens and that we are invested in getting medical care and doctors here and expanding that workforce. So I'm just, I just want to say, I'm just so proud of that, that third, a third and a third, and that the state can have a share of that and really demonstrates our commitment to um, good you know, health, public health policy and our doctors. So I'm, I've really learned so much in that time. And it's been so neat to meet doctors and go through clinics. And so I'm, I'm just so impressed by the work and the amount of health care they're providing. So I, I'm just pleased with our state with that. Thank you so much, Senator. And we truly appreciate your support and advocacy on JFAC. That's enabled us to, to get this far in the plan. Um, I would also note too, that for that $60,000 per year per resident is what we're shooting for, support from the state in return, um, you saw the numbers highlighted on the economic impact. The return on investment is really incredible. Each Idaho physician supports 12 jobs in their community, both directly and indirectly, and um, nearly $2 million per physician of uh, economic impact. So um, thanks, Jamie. <laughs> so that's good information. So this really is um, an excellent investment by the state. We get a great return economically. And of course, uh, folks taking care of our patients, most of the time are, are more uh, marginalized patients at that. Any, or, any other questions or comments on graduate medical education? Susie, this is Dr. Pinter. And I wanna appreciate uh, Dr. or uh, Representative Furches and Senator Wintrow's uh, commentary. <clears throat> so I am a independent physician here in the state of Idaho. I've been here for almost 10 years. I'm a nephrologist, so a medicine, internal medicine subspecialist. And we are charged in many different venues in the education for the young trainees. Um, and these are the residents, not only in family practice, but also in internal medicine, which has two vibrant residency programs that are well managed in our state. We're also tasked with educating our WAMI students that are coming from the University of Washington, and also recently in educating our ICOM students that are coming through during their clinical clerkships. And I can tell you that as an attending physician, as an independent private practitioner, that having a student uh, or a internal medicine or resident or family practice resident with you is a lot of work. I am not reimbursed for that. I do it out of the goodness of my heart and out of the importance of the necessity to train quality physicians in our community. What I've seen personally and what I think the absolute benefit of expanding uh, graduate medical education services within the state of Idaho is the following. I know that the physicians that are being trained in the program in this state are excellent physicians. Not only because I've trained them, that's a, that's a laugh, <laughs> uh, but um, because I know that when they do stay in our community and they work in our local health systems, as hospitalist physicians, or they go on to train in subspecialty training and then return to our state, or if they stay on in outpatient clinic responsibilities like many of our family practice uh, colleagues do, that you know, they can, through their relationship with me, um, refer to me as a subspecialist in the care of patients that they see with clinical situations that uh, necessitate necessitate nephrology care, but then they are also excellent resources for me to refer patients to them when I have patients that enter into our health system that don't have primary care physicians and need them desperately. And I couldn't agree more with Susie and several of the other commentary that the majority of the patients that the internal medicine resident as well as the family practice physicians in training care for are a very underserved and vulnerable population. And without the care that they provide for these individuals, that care would not be done. 
Um, and I think expanding that care is vitally important for the state of Idaho. When, uh, when we look at the three-legged stool, as Susie had pointed to in her early description, that's exactly what it is. And I think the state of Idaho, through its uh, development of this program, is really necessary in stepping up and assisting in the training of these young doctors with the obvious hope that they're going to stay in our community. And that's, uh, I, have, I can answer any questions if anybody has any from the uh, representative or senator side, I'm, I'm happy to, to offer any other insights. Thank you. Susie, this is Mary. I'd just like to make a comment. So hello, everybody. I'm Mary Bernaga. I'm uh, a family doctor here in Idaho and a product of one of the residencies in Idaho that I was lucky to go to. You know, in addition to the, the towns where our residencies are located, which are dispersed throughout the state, um, most of the residencies also have their residents spend time in rural communities throughout the state. So it's, um, it's very important for these folks to get exposure to the entire state. And at most of the critical access hospitals in the state, you will see residents rotating and getting a, a real taste of what it's like to practice in underserved areas uh, throughout our state. And then oftentimes those places are able to recruit them back to practice there. And so you can see that in places like Orofino or Cottonwood or Jerome or Rexburg or many, many places like that. So that's, um, there's a strong emphasis on, on a workforce for the entire state, not just the urban areas. Excellent. Thank you. And uh, Dr. Williams, I see you have your hand up. Sure. Uh, I want to tee off on a couple of things that, that Tom said and Mary. Um, I, think, I think we're far enough on the path of GME development to start talking about the 20, 30 year vision. And I'm, I'm not an author of this vision, but I, I know it's in everybody's hearts. So, so um, what, what, are we, what are we building for uh, into the future? Right now, Idaho has great medical care from a quality um, a, a system level care provision standpoint. We, we attract very good physicians, very well-trained physicians from all over the country, even though we don't grow as many as any state that has a, a, a fully fledged GME program does. But, but because of strong healthcare systems, because it's a great state to live in, because of a robust uh, board of medicine process, uh, we, we, do, we do great work for a rural state. And here we are with our exploding population. So compare that to our neighbors to the south in Utah. Uh, University of Utah, the Salt Lake City area has world-class medical care, GME development sophistication. And that's what we're working for. So we started with primary care. And sometime we're gonna be starting to talk about a general surgery residency, an OBGYN residency, we're working on a pediatrics residency. And so we're gonna develop more and more sophistication, but we have to have that as we become a bigger and bigger state. And that's how we wanna develop. So, so here we are uh, with a very successful fledgling process to build GME and we're only going to keep growing. But as we build more resources with medical systems, we'll have that, that infrastructure. But, but that's, that's the long-term goal. So we can, we can be like where I came from in Arkansas. And we can be like Salt Lake City. And we can be like San Francisco and Portland, our surrounding centers of excellence. So we're on the path. Thank you so much. And uh, in the interest of time, it, I'm sorry, was there another question? Well, I, I was looking for the raise a hand thing and I'm not seeing it, but <laughs> um, I'm not the best at this, but I did have a quick question because oh, it, was, it was brought up about rural communities. My dad was a dentist for 40 years and virtually all of it was in rural communities, North Dakota, Washington. And when he was trying to sell a practice, it was rather difficult to get a professional to adopt the rural, small town, everybody knows your business lifestyle. And they wanted to gravitate to the bigger cities where there was more to do and things like that. How successful is the program at getting people to stay in those rural communities where the 
nightlife and <laughs> stuff may not be as robust? That's a great question. And you, you point out um, a very real challenge that as a rural state we face. Um, what I do know is um, Idaho, um, compared to other states in the country, I believe ranks in the top 10 for our retention of uh, residency graduates, physicians who end up practicing in our state. Um, I don't have the specific uh, distribution. I know we have an awesome map that shows where all of the residency graduates are practicing in the state of Idaho. So we'll make a note to get that to you, but uh, we do have coverage throughout the state. And that's why these rural training tracks are so neat that they do get the opportunity. And for those for whom it's a good fit, they, they learn and they experience that rural lifestyle and they do end up staying. I wanna say our retention rate is just over 50%, but uh, Please correct me, Dr. Uh, Mudge or Mary or anybody if that's not correct, but we'll follow up with you on that, Representative Furch, and actually all the legislators on this call, because that's an excellent question. Okay, thank you. Thank you. We, um, we do retain, I believe, 60% or over 60% um, and just in Idaho, not the surrounding areas. And then I believe about half of those go rural. I, I believe um, maybe Mary or um, Suzanne Allen might know for sure, but I think about 30% of those go rural. So a fair amount of our graduates every year. Wonderful, I'm thank you. I'm happy to just anecdotally add to that. I'm Rachel, I'm one of our second year family med residents. I grew up in the Midwest, um, did my rural rotations up in Grangeville and Orofino, and I loved it. I'm actually strongly considering staying in Idaho and trying to start looking into seeing whether or not I can make things work up in the northern sector of Idaho. I know one of my classmates is really interested in staying in salmon. Um, a good handful of us are already considering trying to find jobs in some of the rural communities that we've rotated. Um, so anecdotally, I know it's a pretty strong retention and I know that the funding to have amazing faculty and a ton of support to teach us really strong, rurally focused skills um, really supports that. So thank you to the state for that. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that insight. Very, very helpful. <laughs> okay. Well, in the interest of time, I'm going to um, move us along to our next topic. And legislators, if you do have more questions uh, about GME, please reach out and we will follow up with you on that and be sure to get that map for you as well. So um, the next topic we're going to talk about is um, the Idaho Patient Act and trying to uh, make some fixes to that. So with that, I'll hand it back over to uh, Dr. Joe Williams. Thank you. Um, I'm Joe Williams. I'm a urologist in Meridian. I'm part of a nine physician urology group. We're independent. Uh, I've been here for 23 years um, and um, I, I was, I'm a native Idahoan and, and I, I love practicing here and love the state. Um, so I want to talk about the Idaho Patient Act. It was passed in 2020. The IMA board then understood the problems in medical billing leading to its being proposed. And we were neutral per policy as it made its way into law. We were very concerned about unintended consequences of the legislation in a process largely dictated by payers, not individual physician practices. We worked hard in 2020 to smooth out processes the bill would create, but made little impact. Through the latter part of 2020 into 2021, we've worked very diligently with the Idaho Hospital Association, Independent Doctors of Idaho, the Idaho um, uh, Dentistry Association, and the originators of the legislation to make compliance with the legislation easier and better for patients and practices. The legislature heard our voices last year and passed House Bill 42. This important legislation delayed several provisions of the IPA to July 1st, 2021. This was critical as the original legislation mandated significant administrative changes and workarounds um, made very much more difficult by stresses caused, of course, by the pandemic. 
Basic difficulties for practices, however, have not gone away. We, with the previously mentioned coalition, have met every other week to hammer out problems with the clear purpose to not shift new burdens onto patients. Remaining issues we're working on include several categories of problems. There are four categories. First, cost, technology, privacy. Second, bounce checks. Third, global fees and payment clawbacks. Fourth, the definition of extraordinary collections. First, cost, technology, privacy. Personal information not previously included on billing statements are now required. This puts privacy at risk. Established national vendor electronic health record systems that we are required to use in patient care by the federal government won't allow this information to be put onto statements in their systems. And thus adding it to comply to the IPA is very challenging increasing physician practice administrative overhead significantly, thus increasing the cost of medical care. When Medicare and Department of Defense health plan patients are involved, the social security number is used as the patient payer member number. And the IPA makes us make that non-private. Second, bounce checks. When a patient passes a bad check with an insufficient amount of funds, a medical practice has a limited amount of time to correct the situation. The Patient Act inhibits this ability due to the extended timelines before utilizing extraordinary collection actions. A shorter window with notification to the patient is one option to correct this problem. Next, global fees and payment clawbacks. Some healthcare services are reimbursed by insurance companies as global fees or bundled payments. Physicians cannot bill for these services until the last session in the bundle is completed. For example, maternity care is typically not billed until the child is born. So all the care in the prior nine months goes unrecompensed until we have a baby. Additionally, payment clawbacks occur when an insurance company determines after the fact that it should not have paid a claim or part of a claim for a variety of reasons. The insurer, usually between six months to a year later, takes back payment from the physician and it becomes the patient's responsibility. If in both the bundled payment plan and insurance clawback scenarios, the timelines from the date of service in the Patient Act prohibit physicians from complying with the law. There should be changes to allow for these unique situations. Fourth, definition of extraordinary collection processes. So it's not a simple category of billing processes. There's several different aspects to it. One aspect is reporting an outstanding bill to a credit agency. And this is a highly effective measure at prompting patients to pay their bills and avoid incurring any permanent adverse credit flags. It's a relatively simple intervention that is effective and avoids litigation, which is a bigger mess for patients with long-term credit consequences. Currently, the IPA includes credit agency reporting as an extraordinary collection. Taking this kind of step out of that defined category would help practices get paid for legitimate medical services and would keep patients out of hot water. The IMA and our healthcare coalition, all of those organizations that I mentioned, have worked with Malaluka to develop language to address all of the issues mentioned above. While there isn't a final consensus from Malaluka, the conversations continue with the company and legislators to find a compromise. It should be noted that we started with 14 big categories and the four issues before you 
represent a concession and a compromise from the entire healthcare community. We are respectfully requesting your support for language to fix these issues. As the next presenter will tell you, times are tough in the physician community, especially during the pandemic, and we need all the help we can get making healthcare more efficient with less administrative burden. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Williams. Any questions or comments uh, from our legislators about uh, the Idaho Patient Act? This is probably information you haven't really heard from us before. Me again. Yes, please, Representative um, Church. So along the lines of clawbacks and bounce checks, there's an issue with secondary insurances. And so you have an initial billing to a primary insurance, and then that needs to be adjudicated. And if the insurance company takes their full allotment of 30 days uh, under the Fair Claims Processing Act, then it has to go to the secondary or the supplemental. And there are occasions where there's been a change in the, in the ID number. And so it gets sent in with one ID number to the secondary, but then you get a statement back where it is no longer an effective policy. Then you gotta contact the patient, find out what happened. Oh, we got new ID cards. And then you go through the process. Did, did you intentionally leave that sort of scenario out in your compromising? Um, there, there just really are numerous, numerous other flaws to this, um, you know, the the ninety day uh, prohibition on on that collections thing, um, you know, healthcare providers they can't repo the knee replacement. They don't have other remedies to recover those expenses. And again, I have experience with my dad who's a dentist, and it's a high overhead bill or uh, profession. And when he delivers a crown for a thousand dollars, he's got $500 in a lab bill. And this law mandates that you devalue your accounts receivable by waiting the 90 days to take any aggressive collections efforts. Mm -hmm. And so did you intentionally leave out multitudes of other very significant shortcomings in this law in an attempt to just stick with these four or um it representative great question and and i know you know these situations better than most the answer to your question is no our original list had close to a dozen different issues on it and the one you raise about secondary insurance coverage has been raised by our uh, members numerous times as well when we address this issue with Melaleuca, what they have said is that you meet the requirements of the Idaho Patient Act if you submit the to the insurance company provided by the patient at the time of service within that 45 day window. Even if it ends up being the wrong insurance company, that you still have met the requirement in order to proceed. So because we asked them this question several times and what the answer they gave us was, if you submit within the time frame, and you can document that you did it with the information given to you by the patient at that time, you meet the threshold and then you can proceed on. Um, so that was why after we pursued that about the secondary insurance billing issues, that we did not include that on the list because there wasn't a legislative fix necessary because they said it would be interpreted as, meet, as meeting the spirit of the law. I hope that helps somewhat. Yeah, I don't recall that being clear in the language. Oh, I'm sure it's law. not. <laughs> um, and so who gets to say whether or not you acted in the spirit of the law, mm -hmm. you know, and, and 
you know, I had challenges with the with the inability to privately contract and have, you know, financial policies, you know, any, you know, two willing parties sitting down and saying, this is the clinic financial policy. Do you like it or not? And that, you know, this law bisects, you know, the right to contract. So lots of lots of issues. I just wondered how much energy you'd put into the other ones. <laughs> we did. Susie, this Chuck, oh, Susie, this is Chuck Winder. Oh, yes, please. Question uh, for Dr. Williams. Uh, first of all, Dr. Williams, thanks for your service Veterans Day uh, <laughs> last week. And uh, thanks for that. Um, when you were explaining the four areas, and maybe you're not the one to ask, maybe it's uh, Susie, but explain to me the, I think it was the fourth item that dealt with the uh, collection uh, agencies. Uh, that's kind of what started all this was the collection agencies hiring an outside attorney, or in some cases actually being one and the same, and kind of the abuses that we thought were going on on that side of it. Um, Talk to me a little bit about what you're trying to accomplish with the uh, collection agent side of your fourth point. I, I'll defer to, to Susie. Uh, she, she's done the heavy lifting with the biweekly meetings for the last 45 years okay. <laughs> in the last, in the last right. year. So I would defer to Susie. 45 weeks, maybe. It <laughs> felt like 45 years. Um, Senator, your question is a good one, and I think it's important to make a distinction between collection agencies, which you are correct. That was the genesis of the problem with some questionable practices there. We're talking about credit reporting agencies. So these are the national groups. And as we went down this road, um, the Patient Act puts a report to a credit agency in the same bucket and at the same level as a collection agency suing a patient and taking them to court. What we learned by talking to our practice managers is after they have sent out the bill three times, so at least we'll say 30, I'm sorry, 90 days has gone by at this time. One of the first things that they do is report it to a credit agency. And what we have learned from one of the largest uh, practices here in the Valley is that that has been a remarkably effective tool because they have had patient after patient when they go to refinance their house or buy a new boat, they have this outstanding bill on the credit reporting agency report and they really want that new boat. So they come in and pay their bill at the doctor's office and they move on, it's resolved, it's no longer on their credit report. So we feel that is a lower level intervention that our practices tell us is very effective. It's not a permanent swipe against the patient. It's something that can be remedied. So what we are asking is to say, if folks waive their right to take someone to court and sue them, send them to collections and go through that process, could we in return allow them to use the credit reporting agency tool? Um, and, and we have language to that effect. Okay, thank you for the clarification. You're welcome. And um, Ken, did you have something that you wanted to add? No, I think I, I was just gonna add what you just said. Thank okay. you. Okay, <laughs> thank you. So. Any other questions or concerns from our legislators? I will just say that Ken has um, drafted some amendments that provide some solutions to those four areas. Um, fairly straightforward language and we're ready to share that with you uh, here in the next little bit. Uh, Representative Nekachea. Yeah, Susie, I apologize if I missed this, but I just didn't understand. Um, you have these four points. Where are you at in the, the, the negotiation with the proponents of the Idaho Patient Act? Yeah, so um, it has been quite an extensive process. We started meeting with representatives from Melaleuca in April, 
And we met every other week throughout the spring and summer and into the fall. We got to a point where we negotiated back and forth and um, they were pretty firm in not wanting to make any changes to the legislation, even though we were able to point out problems such as the law requires a patient's full social security number to be printed on the bill. So we finally narrowed it down, I wanna to say to a list of maybe 10 issues. And then from there narrowed it down to these four. Um, we have met with them uh, and said, this is really what we wanna push for. And um, right now we're at a point where we agreed that we would then pursue this legislatively. So we are still working with them. Um, I would, I can't speak for them. Um, their position has been one of not compromising. And so it's been pretty tough, but I feel we have come a very long way in, as Representative Furch pointed out, a list of dozens of problems down to four that we are trying to address in statute. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I would simply just point out that one way to limit the collections costs is to not ignore the judge's order or fight the garnishment once the judge has made the order. Um, that, that would go a long way at minimizing the, um, the cost of honoring an obligation to the facility. Thank you for that. Any other thoughts or questions on that? If not, we will move on to our next topic and I'll try and get us somewhat back on schedule here, but the discussion has been just so good. So we really appreciate everyone's questions and comments. So um, our third topic, I'll hand it back over to Dr. Pintar, um, just uh, with a little conversation and the IMA and ACMS's support for the rights of private businesses. Dr. Pintar. So one of the concerns has been the individual mandates uh, for vaccinations. And much of that has been very contentious. But what I believe um, is important is that, you know, in support of the science and rights of private businesses, as you can see from the slide in front of you, that the current research really demonstrates a very high effectiveness for COVID-19 vaccinations, not only against hospitalizations and serious illness, but clearly have been against death. And as a frontline physician in this war on this terrible disease, um, I see it every day. Um, and I can use any number of anecdotal occurrences of patients that I've cared for for many, many years who for whatever reason have chosen not to become vaccinated, who contract this disease and are no longer with us. Whereas I have the same number of patients who have embraced the idea of vaccination, who still contract the disease and come down with the sniffles or at least a mild illness that doesn't require severe uh, interventions within the hospitalization system. An important um, model of how to look at this is that as a business, as an independent private practice nephrology uh, system that we are in currently, we really need freedom to implement policies that keep the workplace that we deliver care safe, not only for our patients, but clearly for our teammates and our employees. And I work in two different venues, primarily besides the health systems. I work in dialysis clinics and I work in a private uh, independent practice office setting. Um, and you know where healthcare settings and employers are coming close together, um, what, what we see is that there is a potential for transmission. Um, and we need to keep our, our economy strong and we need to keep our employees working. We need to keep our patients safe. Um, you know, in terms of the idea of exemptions, 
uh, for medical reasons or religious or sincerely held beliefs. Um, these are a part of established law and are currently being dealt with, uh, I think, in venues where they become appropriate. I can share with you that in terms of our own independent private practice, our feeling was early on when the local health systems were mandating vaccinations that when we discussed uh, the importance of vaccination with our clinical staff, we felt that it was a vital tool, not only to keep our patients safe, of course, but also to keep our, our staff safe. But we had several staff members that for many different reasons felt that they could not comply with becoming vaccinated. And as an independent private practice, it was important for us to be able to make those decisions for the safety of our patients and our staff to come up with mechanisms uh, for testing and for masking and for the safe care of individuals within our clinics and our dialysis centers in order to you know, provide the best care we can. Um, I think it's important uh, you know, from not only a personal standpoint, but also from a public health standpoint that all of us in the healthcare uh, milieu you know, demonstrate an important and scientifically based uh, model of thinking and information uh, expression that meets the current uh, kind of standard of uh, information that is out there for the benefit of our public health. And that is that the vaccine is safe and extremely effective. Um, I don't disparage people who choose not to get the vaccine. I don't disparage people or shame people who choose for whatever reason to seek other methods of care. And of course, I would never uh, withhold care from anyone who have chosen not to receive uh, these safe and effective tools to combat this terrible pandemic. But at the same time, our job as healthcare providers is to provide that concise and consistent message. And I think it's important for our legislatures to recognize this. Um, and I'm happy to any, answer any questions uh, if there are any. Yes, uh, Dr. Pinter, thank you yes. for your presentation. This is uh, Chuck Winder. Um, are there any studies that regarding the uh, spreader effect or the or the likelihood of spreading uh, COVID-19 of, of, of a vaccinated person versus an unvaccinated or a person that may have had COVID at one time? Um, I, I can tell you this, I'm, I'm not the world's expert on the latest uh, and greatest research. I try and keep up like everybody else in this field of expanding information. I can tell you that a vaccinated person can contract the illness um, and a vaccinated person can transmit the illness. The likelihood of a vaccinated person becoming seriously ill or dying is infinitesimally lower than what it is for an unvaccinated individual. Um, you know, with that being said, our main incentive, primarily for the patients that we care for when speaking to their family members, uh, particularly in the vulnerable population of patients that I care for with end stage kidney disease or advanced chronic medical problems, is that their family needs to really strongly consider being vaccinated to protect their elderly vulnerable loved one uh, from acquiring this disease uh, surreptitiously. And if I've seen it once, I've seen it probably more than a hundred times now where patient family members will not become vaccinated, not follow strict hygienic processes, not be masked in public settings, et cetera, come home with the disease, pass it to their elderly family member who's vulnerable and clinically chronically ill. And that individual then subsequently become 
terribly ill. If they're vaccinated, they generally don't die. Um, you know, I spent uh, two weeks on our inpatient hospital service in early September, and I was astounded to see the extent of the illness within the health systems. And I think the crisis standards of care that were implemented in the, implemented in the state of Idaho actually came about almost too late because we were, we were rationing care. And it was as simple as that. We were providing suboptimal therapy to incredibly ill individuals in the hospitals because we had limited resources available. And, you know, I have many colleagues within the intensive care unit uh, field in both health systems in the Valley, both within St. Luke's and St. Alphonsus. And I can only tell you the stress and the burden that they were facing on a daily basis um, for the sheer numbers of patients and the sheer extent of the illnesses that they were having to care for. So this disease, unfortunately, is all too real and all too important for uh, our, our culture and our community to recognize first and foremost, and then to use the tools at our disposal to try and remediate. The COVID pandemic is not gonna go away. It's, it's here to stay, in my opinion. And I don't think there's probably ever gonna be a day in my career as a physician that I enter into a health system without a mask, without some kind of vaccination record that will be ongoing. And, and that's sad. Um, my experience as a trainee was I wore a, a mask one time in the care of a patient who was critically ill when I was in training, one time before our pandemic uh, erupted. Uh, and that's not to say I didn't wear a mask, obviously, if I was in the OR providing, you know, clinical services right. necessitating, you know, being masked or gloved or gowned and PPE. Um, but I cared for a patient with um, a meningococcal meningitis. And I was handed a mask when I walked in to see him. And that, when I, that was when I was a trainee. And, you know, beginning the uh, early winter of 2020, you know, we were all uh, handed masks and it was a real difficult concept, but now I, I don't think we're ever going to get away from it. Um, if I might. Oh, sorry. Please go ahead, Senator Winder. Thank you. Um, we've had, you know, several hearings over the last couple of days. And uh, one of the things that was represented, uh, at least to me, was that uh, Utah has a significantly higher success rate of treating COVID than Idaho does. Are there any kind of studies or factual information uh, as to is there a difference in treatment? Uh, are they doing things different than we're doing? Uh, are there things we could do to improve ours? Or is that just uh, metropolitan rhetoric out there on the in the world today yeah i i'm just going to break in here for a moment and i apologize dr huntington because i know you have good expert information on this but um these are the kinds of questions that the ima uh, public health committee is tackling and um we do have some information that that committee has produced with respect to antibodies uh, vaccination versus natural infection immunity, et cetera. But the question you raise is a very good one. And if anybody can, um, I would refer everyone to the chat. Um, some other physicians have chimed in with some additional information, but I think it would be worthwhile, Senator Winder, if we take this question to um, our public health committee and ask them to produce another white paper on this topic. Um, the process that they go through is they look at all of the available literature and the folks on that committee um, who range from in infectious disease experts from Idaho Falls to Coeur d'Alene and 
Um, also, Dr. Hahn, the state epidemiologist, is a part of our committee. So it really is a great group of folks, and I think we can ask them um, to provide that information for you. Um, and, and Dr. Huntington, if you could, um, if you would like Thanks, to chime in with additional comments, um, we'll we'll do that. And then I I apologize that I have to move us along to keep on our schedule. Yeah, well, part of part of my comment, uh, hopefully you can hear me, part of my comment was um, to answer uh, Senator Winter's comment, and then I can also move into uh, if you want me to speak as well. But to answer that specifically, we just had a conversation about this with one of our, our infectious disease colleagues, and the folks who've been vaccinated have a, you know, they do have a viral load, but it lasts very short, um, that their, their immune system is able to take care of it very quickly. People who have not been vaccinated their viral load spikes up and it lasts for quite a bit longer. Um, so they are replicating uh, that virus much for a much longer time period. And so they are much more contagious and spreading it for a much longer time period. So that's kind of the short answer of that. Excellent. And if you would like to move along to our last topic, then um, we'll do that and then move on to our breakout rooms, which will be a little shorter time frame, but we'll, uh, we'll move through. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, I will keep it, I'll keep it brief. Um, I, uh, my name is Ann Huntington. I am also a native of Idaho. I grew up in West Boise and was a, actually a volunteer in high school at St. Luke's, went away to the University of Utah for medical school as an Idaho student, one of the eight spots that year. Um, and then I came back to Idaho um, out after residency training and um, you know, came back home. I have been an outpatient physician, internal medicine physician, uh, outpatient and inpatient. So in the clinic and in the hospital and for the last three years have worked just in the hospital setting, um, have had the pleasure of taking care of many wonderful native Idahoans as well as many tra transplant folks that have come here to the state and, and really seen that growth. Um, this has been a, a difficult couple of years uh, for us uh, from, from many different specialties and, and all throughout the state. Uh, and, the, and the country. Um, I just hope to give a few little snapshots of, of what we are seeing, a little bit of perspective. And um, certainly we all have different perspectives and, and I value others' perspectives, um, certainly as they may be different from my own and, and would love to learn from others. Um, so a few things that we have experienced has been you know, significant growth um, throughout the area, as you all know, and uh, many needs um, as we have tried to tackle the, the burden of a lot of patients coming in through the outpatient clinics, through the, the specialty consults and in through the hospital. And that has been further exacerbated in the last, you know, during the pandemic in the last few months specifically. Um, we have learned a lot through this time period. I will focus um, kind of most specifically on the past few months in my experience as an inpatient um, physician and a, a leader of about 50 hospitalists, so adult medical hospitalists uh, who have taken care of the bulk of uh, COVID-19 patients as well as uh, in addition to our critical care uh, physicians. We have learned some new skills. We have learned a whole new skill set as we have done this. Um, I have heard you know, people say that this is just like the flu. And I will say uh, this disease is nothing like influenza that I have seen. And I actually trained in a, in a big H1N1 year um, where we did a lot of you know, ICU care and, and inpatient care. Uh, it's a very different disease clinically. Um, I have never seen influenza do the things that I've seen COVID do. Um, I have never seen uh, this pneumonia before. Um, and I'll give some perspective about that. I have never seen patients with stroke so readily um, from a respiratory virus uh, or heart attacks in 40 year olds uh, who have no heart disease underlying. I've never seen so many blood clots in people with a respiratory virus or kidney failure or, um, or the neurologic um, uh, issues that we've been seeing. I've never seen so much long you know, post-viral syndromes in my friends and my neighbors. Um, so there's many things that this, that this is different from any other respiratory virus that we've taken care of and we take care of many in the hospital. Um, it's also a different patient population. Uh, initially we saw you know, a lot more elderly patients we saw come in with COVID. Um, 
last year, we saw a lot more people with medical issues. We saw a lot more people with, um, you know, had, who had, uh, you know, different, different medical issues and reasons to be in the hospital. This most recent wave has been completely different. And um, as, you know, many of the chronically medically ill patients were vaccinated, as many of the elderly patients were vaccinated, we saw a whole different uh, patient population who never normally would have been in the hospital. Um, I know at one point our ICU uh, patient uh, average age was 43. And that, to get perspective, that has never happened before that I've ever seen. Um, where many of many people my age who have young kids at home and teenagers were hospitalized with a life-threatening, uh, you know, inflammatory uh, pneumonia due to a respiratory virus. That has been different. Um, we have had many folks um, who have uh, didn't know they had diabetes come in and who didn't know that their obesity was putting them at risk. Um, we have seen the effects certainly of uh, our American diet in in uh, making people at risk for this with their immune systems. Um, I'm a, mer a member of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine and, and feel that um, you know, our, our immune system is at the key, a healthy immune system is at the key of everything that we do. And that includes a lifetime of eating healthy, a lifetime of exercising and of sleeping well and of having ways to reduce stress and take care of our bodies. Uh, Americans have not been good at that and we have not invested in, in public health and in um, those kind of preventative measures as a nation. So we are seeing the effects of that uh, this year. Um, and we have never seen this kind of inflammatory response in, in patients. I've never seen this before where they come in very short of breath and they have COVID pneumonia already. They've already been, they're in the second week of their disease after the virus has replicated for the first week and then the immune system takes over in, with massive inflammation. And we do our best with um, the you know, available evidence-based medications to bring down that inflammation. Many of the treatments that people are using in the outpatient setting um, and you know, to varying degrees of success don't work in this setting, in this inflammatory setting where, the, um, where they go very quickly into respiratory failure. So it's a very different entity that, than what we've ever seen before. And it's been very humbling to take care of these folks. Um, just a few snapshots of what our group has been able to do and, and what we've done. And a lot of it has been mentioned in the public before, but we've you know, stood up different, different surge units and we've, um, we, our, our docs, uh, our hospitalists ha have been pulling 90 extra shifts per month for the past few months to be able to take care of the additional surge so we are working far over time to take care of these folks. Um, we're tired. Our critical care colleagues have been doing the same. Um, I had the opportunity to train over 100 primary care outpatient physicians on how to take care of COVID pneumonia in the inpatient setting. And this was because we knew we were going to run out of doctors to take care of all these folks. Uh, we were going to run out of inpatient doctors to take care of all these folks. Um, it just wasn't possible to take care of that volume on our own. Um, and uh, so we had some fantastic outpatient doctors who hadn't worked in the hospital for a long time, but they were willing to come in, learn the skill set, ask questions where they needed to, and they did a fantastic job. Um, and it, it, we have all of the research, we follow the research, we follow um, the uh, information that, that our infectious disease providers and, and our um, committees who've reviewed the research over and over again, um, we, have, we have been doing that and following that to answer kind of one of the questions. Um, we have um, called, well, we, we collaborated with many of our other specialty colleagues who work in the inpatient setting and offloaded patients to them uh, that they could take care of so that we could focus on taking care of the COVID patients. Uh, and they were very gracious in doing so. Um, we um, took transfers from all across the country. Oftentimes, as people were trying to find inpatient beds for many of their, uh, their patients, the ER doctors were calling sometimes 30 hospitals to find a place for their patient to be admitted and be taken care of. Um, we have experienced a lot of physicians leaving medicine over the last year, and that has been concerning as those who are left have been absorbing that impact. Um, we have had to make difficult decisions and we have utilized our palliative care team very heavily uh, when um, 
oftentimes these folks that have really significant pneumonia are awake and talking to you even though their lungs are failing and they have significant uh, hypoxia or lack of oxygen requiring huge amounts of oxygen oxygen um, and they you know you just see that their lungs are not going to recover from this it is pretty awful to watch um, to reference back to influenza and some of the other respiratory viruses that we often take care of Oftentimes when people need to be in the hospital, they'd be on maybe two or six liters, sometimes more. Sometimes they'll need a ventilator. Um, that's, that's not very common. Sometimes they'll be on more oxygen. Um, this is a disease that um, destroys the lungs very quickly where people often end up on 30, 40 liters of oxygen per minute. It's called high flow, where it's just blowing oxygen in um, to keep their lungs, to keep their oxygen levels um, to where they need to be to oxygenate their brains. Um, sometimes we've had people on 60 or 80 liters. Sometimes we've had people on continuous BiPAP masks to try to oxygenate their lungs to give them a chance to survive. By the time they often need to be on a ventilator, um, their risk of dying is very high because their lungs are so sick and they do not recover quickly. So th those are some of the th things that we've seen um, that has been far different than anything else we've seen before. Um, there's been a lot of, um, I know people trying to, when they're in this situation and they don't know if they will make it out, they you know, need to put their affairs in order. And those are things that usually people my age don't have to do very often. Um, and it has happened a lot more. Um, I know that one of my colleagues has um, mentioned, you know, mentioned in his 25 years of practice, he has um, you know, written more death certificates than in any other previous year and often in many years combined. So it's been a very it's been a very tough year to see that and and also to see um, you know the information that has been out in you know in the community where you know people don't haven't seen what we're seeing and it is hard to be able to convey that on on what we're really seeing when it's um, it's a uh, you know we can't have everybody everybody come in the hospital and and see that so that has been difficult um, I guess I'm just trying to think if there's anything else that would be pertinent I know. Um, that there was a, a, a life coach that spoke to a group of physicians uh, in the last year and heard their stories. Um, and, and she ultimately, as a very well-known life coach, ultimately said, um, you know, I, I typically do coaching with a lot of military veterans. And the stories that she was hearing were very similar. And, and again, um, I, would not, um, I would not totally equate this. There are similarities, but it is not the same experience. But she said that this was as close to those kind of traumatic situations as um, she had seen in, in many that have served in our military. Um, this is similar to what our first responders have seen. Uh, there's, you know, there's, this touches many aspects of the community for sure. Um, many of our nurses are therapists. Uh, I have heard of a, one of our ICU nurses who left was, um, you know, so traumatized from what she had seen over and over again that she left being an ICU nurse as an, and as a checker at Walmart. And that is um, that was her choice to um, be able to protect herself. Um, so very, very difficult. Uh, now we are uh, faced with a situation where our physicians are tired and our, um, and our nursing staff is often very new. We have a lot of traveling nurses because of uh, what has happened and a lot of new nurses that have stepped to the plate to help out, um, and that that does place extra burden on them and on us because they're they don't have you know the same experience that uh, someone who has been doing that for ten or fifteen years would have. Um, so I hope uh, I hope that gives a little bit more perspe perspective on on some of the differences. I know that um, that others have shared that in in public in the community. Uh, feel free to you know ask any questions as well. Thank you, uh, Susie. Uh, if I may, uh, Dr. Huntington. Please. Please. Um, I again. I I'm in St. Al's quite often, and I have talked to a lot of nurses and doctors there, and so I kind of know. Thank you for that firsthand. As policymakers, what can we do? Um, Senator Martin, thank you, and um, Dr. Huntington. Wow. Thank you for your, your heartfelt insights. And I know all of your colleagues uh, feel that too. Uh, Senator Martin, thank you for your question. 
Um, in terms of policy, the IMA is looking to replicate a very successful uh, program that the Ada County Medical Society has in which it offers free confidential counseling to physicians. Um, a lot of physicians have access to EAP employee assistance programs through their workplaces, but unfortunately there is such a stigma around physicians seeking mental health assistance that a lot of folks don't feel comfortable doing that. So the ACMS program has been very successful in offering that free confidential counseling um, to physicians who need it. And um, the IMA has been charged by our membership to take that program statewide. So we're in the process of doing that. Um, one of the things that we would like you all to consider from a policy standpoint, probably not this year, but maybe in subsequent years, is to give some confidentiality protections around that sort of program in the same way uh, we have confidentially confidentiality protections around other sorts of peer review and, and those sorts of activities, or if a physician is in a uh, substance abuse recovery program, for instance. So these types of confidential counseling programs are not yet contemplated in the law, so I think we would like to bring that into the fold. So that would be one thing from a policy standpoint. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Huntington, any, any policy? What As policymakers, what should we be doing? It's a great question. I don't know. I don't uh, know what to say other than um, I agree with Susie that things that would help um, protect us as we are trying to protect our patients, um, you know, allow us to um, have. Uh, I think we've, you know, asked for you know some time off, some uh, mental and emotional help, um, some uh, I think help from the community in some of the things that we've we've asked for. Um, and just, I think, helping uh, people understand a different perspective. I think there's, um, there's a lot of humility in learning from each other and learning different perspectives. So this doesn't, I'm not answering your policy question, but just in asking how the community could help, um, you know, being humble, being teachable, being open to each other's ideas, um, looking at the, the long-term picture um, of, of what this means. I will say that as we um, often had folks who had maybe been vaccinated a week before they got COVID and they came into the hospital with COVID um, and they, we had several folks that were on a lot of oxygen and getting really, really sick. And then their vaccine kicked in and they got better much more quickly. It was, it was a really interesting phenomenon and we've seen this several times. So we know, you know, and, and just very few people that got the monoclonal antibody came in sick with COVID. Very few people that got, that were vaccinated um, came in with COVID. So anything we could do to help um, support that um, increasing access to the monoclonal antibody infusion, which is far more effective than, than many of the other treatments that are being used as well as, um, the vaccination rate. Um, I think some of my other physician colleagues may have some ideas. Um, I think, you know, just having, as, there, as the, the chat's blowing up, which is fantastic, um, and having that opportunity for maybe the, some of the frontline physicians to really interact with some more people in the community, um, and, and that would be fantastic as well. And again, all those that are listening, you doctors and support people, I, again, thank you. I, I've tried to be at, in St. Al's every week for the last months now, and I, I'm impressed every time I'm there. I, I talk to the staff and the doctors and patients as they leave. Uh, it, it just amazes me all that you do. Thank you for what you do, and, and please, I appreciate the comments, but feel free to personally call me and tell me what, as policymakers, what do we need to be doing to, to to get through this. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Thank you, Dr. Huntington. Uh, thank you, Senator Martin. So um, in the last couple minutes that we have, um, we're gonna actually go ahead and uh, forego the breakout rooms uh, just because the uh, discussion uh, here in the big group has been so robust. But um, I would like to give some time for our legislative leaders um, to give us some, some parting thoughts. Um, for the physicians who may not be aware, the session that reconvened on Monday actually adjourned today. 
Um, and so I would like to ask um, Senator Winder and Representative Rubel to each take a couple minutes um, to, uh, to please give us your perspectives on that. So uh, Senator Winder, I'll, I'll start with you, please. Ladies first. Oh, well, <laughs> Minority Leader Rubel, please go ahead. <laughs> All right, well, you might get two different sides of the coin here. Um, but yeah, I was actually very pleased with the outcome of the session. Um, for a number of reasons, um, but, you know, first of all, you know, with 36 bills and 72 hours, um, it was just certainly on the House side. Um, I felt there was no credible way for us to have the kind of deliberative process that you'd want to see for such an important subject matter. Uh, you know, the first day when everything was printed, um, they were rushing to committee. Even the committee members didn't really have time to print them and read them before they got there. Once you got to committee, um, the folks testifying didn't hadn't been able to read any of the bills when they were asked which bill they read, what they liked, which one they didn't. They just were like, well, I don't know. I haven't read any of them. I'm just mad about vaccine mandates. Um, but it was really a challenge. Yeah, uh, you know, I did request some attorney general opinions. I, there was only time to generate opinions on three out of the bills. Um, and those opinions came back indicating that there were pretty serious legal concerns um, that it was going to put employers. So most of these bills related to banning private employers from asking about vaccines, from requiring vaccines, you know, et cetera. Um, but a good number of these bills would have really put employers in a bind where they would, if, if the federal mandates are upheld, we don't know where that'll go, but um, if they are upheld, then it would force employees, employers to choose between violating state law and violating federal law, um, which, you know, caused me a lot of concern because I hate to put, you know, employers, everybody's been through the ringer this last year and a half, but, uh, you know, businesses and employers, not the least of them, um, but to tell them, you know, we're going to force you to break the law, you choose whether you break federal law or state law, um, felt kind of unfair to our business community. Um, and they did come out, they testified much more on the Senate side than on the, the House side. Um, but I felt like, you know, between the procedural problems and some of these substantive and legal problems, um, it really felt like the best choice was to not pass anything in this session, let the federal courts do their work for a while, see where all that shakes out, and, you know, let cooler heads kind of come in during the regular session when we have a normal schedule and bills, you know, can be printed one day, give people a couple days to read them, give people a couple days to figure out when the committee hearing is, come in and testify, um, and just move forward in a more deliberative process. Um, so in the end, um, no bills with binding effect were passed, um, which to my mind was really the best outcome. Um, because it, you know, it, it gives the private sector more room to put in the rules that they deem uh, necessary for their own employees and for their own businesses, and just gives the process a little bit more breathing room to have better due process, better participation, better vetting of bills. Um, so that was that was my perspective on the special session. Thank you so much, Senator Winder. Over to you, please. Uh, I wouldn't really disagree that much. Um, I think there were. Uh, too many bills printed and too little time to actually hear them. Uh, that was part of the process. We actually heard uh, five different Senate bills. Uh, we heard uh, three House bills this morning. Uh, by the time we were through, I think the uh, State Affairs Committee was uh, totally confused. The people that we thought would support the bills didn't support them because they didn't go far enough or they required paperwork or whatever. But I think the real uh, challenge we had in the Senate, and I think, you know, in the House too, but uh, just how do you balance the rights of an employer, the rights of an employee, uh, protect your patients, uh, trying to provide a really deliberative and thoughtful uh, piece of legislation to deal with some very complicated uh, and critical issues to our uh, citizens, to our professionals, uh, to our employers. Uh, it's kind of that old saying, you know, one sh size doesn't fit all. And, and so I think these ideas will continue to be generated. These uh, bills that were brought forward uh, were brought forward uh, yesterday for informational purposes with the idea that uh, over the next seven weeks, we would have people work on it from uh, the various stakeholder groups with the idea that we'd come back in January with some pieces of legislation that maybe had a broader consensus of support. 
but there's still, I think, no matter how we look at it, there's going to be uh, a difference between those that want to basically end uh, vaccine requirements of any kind um, and won't, you know, take any, you know, compromise in that uh, to those that uh, are concerned about uh, our employers and the health of their employees, their ability to do business. Um, this is not an easy issue uh, to deal with. And I think it'll be much better uh, to deal with it during the regular session when we have time to print the bills, get them out, let the committee process work, uh, let citizens know. We had great participation both yesterday and today in our hearings. And I think, you know, people went away actually learning some things from each side and trying to, you know, that's the way you work through these issues and come up with better legislation. So uh, maybe not what some hoped for. They wanted to take, you know, something home uh, that they'd done. Uh, but sometimes doing no harm is better than uh, doing the harm. I agree. <laughs> yes. Well, thank you both for your leadership. And uh, we agree that this was probably the, the best outcome and there's still a lot of things in play. So we'll continue to monitor the situation. Um, in the meantime, legislators, please reach out to the IMA staff or any of the wonderful physicians uh, here on the meeting tonight with your questions. And I have a list of things that we will follow up uh, with the legislators who have made requests. So uh, with that, I will hand it over to uh, Dr. Blake to wrap us up. Uh, thank you all for coming. Um, and I, I'm just, these issues are so relevant to all of us, both physicians and the public. And it's wonderful, the folks that are passionate about working on these issues and bringing them forward tonight. Um, we, for the physicians that are here tonight, um, please uh, complete your survey on where we go forward with the Ada County Medical um, Society and, and the needs, how we can serve you better. Um, so uh, please, I, I know you've gotten an email on that. And um, I think Joseph Bartels won the uh, gift card tonight. So you can get with Steve and claim that. And um, I wanna finally say thank you for all the senators that showed up. Um, we really appreciate having this forum with all of us. And, and representatives. <laughs> I'm sorry, and representatives, yes. Um, so thank you everyone for coming tonight. Um, have a good night. Be safe. Susie, can I say something real fast, yeah. Dr. Martin? Please, please, please go ahead. Okay, please, you all contact a, a, a senator or representative and tell them we get a lot of information. And I won't categorize the information necessarily, but some of it may not be as accurate as others. <laughs> you have tremendous information, professional information please contact a senator or a house member and talk with them and try to, because we get a lot of, lot of information. We heard, I listened to all of the testimony in both the House and the Senate, and you hear a lot of things that you go, I wonder if that's true or not. And please contact us, all of us, as many as you can. Very good. We will get the word out and we'll make sure our members know who their, who their legislators are. Wonderful. Thank you all so much. Stay well. Thank you. You're amazing. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Desi. all the healthcare all. workers. <laughs> Take care. Thank you, Dr. Williams. <laughs> you already gone. Thanks, Senator Martin. Thank oh. you for your service. <laughs> You're welcome, sir. I thought maybe you'd left me. This, no. this is my doctor. This is the best <laughs> doctor in the whole world. <laughs> Thank you, doctor. Thank you all. Have a good night.